So, um, yeah, so thanks um, for joining us again. Uh, today's uh, talk is uh, intended to get you started with um, interacting with uh, batch job schedulers on uh, HPC systems. And in particular, this uh, talk is uh, focused on Slurm, which is, uh, as I'll talk about, is, is pretty much probably the most popular um, batch job scheduler that you might run into when working on HPC systems. Um, just oh, uh, the uh, complex uh, program here is a, is a new program at SDSC, if you haven't uh, attended one of our talks before. But the, the idea for, and it's funded by the, the NSF through the, the cyber training uh, program, the, the idea of the complex series that we have for all the talks you might see on the, the SDSC uh, education website are in, really intended for um, researchers, students, you know, faculty, staff that are not necessarily, um, you know, programmer first um, uh, type of people, right? Where instead you might just be using software that other people develop on HPC systems, uh, uh, developed for H running on HPC systems that you want to use in your, um, in your research. And so the idea of the complex program is really to, you know, present some of the different concepts and ideas and, and tools that you you need to get familiar with even if you're not necessarily like writing you know source code yourself um, but how to sort of interact with uh, supercomputers HPC systems and sort of advanced cyber infrastructure um, this talk today is um, how I sort of have structured it was if you signed up originally I think we put up the the wrong uh, um, abstract originally that this is sort of intended in in I think over the, the course of the complex program, I'm thinking this is going to sort of be three talks on batch computing in, in a series um, when we sort of started designing this last year. Um, I, and the first one here, I put a link to uh, sort of my first draft of what I thought the batch computing uh, talk would be. And it turned out to be way too long, but this uh, is now going to be sort of a um, a, a prequel talk eventually that we'll, we'll come back where um, we'll, we'll talk about how to interact with sort of uh, the Linux scheduler. It's kind of important to know sort of um, some of the concepts that go on there since all of the um, processes and jobs that you run uh, even on an HPC system sort of, you know, at the end of the day, the, the Linux scheduler is involved. Um, so if you want to go back and sort of look at that sort of draft talk there, um, you can definitely uh, click on that link and, 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 and review that if you want to see sort of what that talk is all about um, and sort of the, the next iteration will be maybe sometime next year. Um, today obviously is about sort of getting started with batch job scheduling with Slurm. So we'll review sort of um, how to get your first batch jobs running on an HPC system with Slurm. That's the intended talk for today. And later on this year, uh, there will be a talk on sort of high throughput and sort of many task computing, where um, if you have to run large amounts of many jobs through a scheduler, that's sort of what's intended um, in, in that talk. And that's scheduled later in October this year. Um, so, uh, yeah, so today's goals are the following. I really want you to, this is really intended for an introduction to what is a batch job, what is Slurm, this, you know, scheduler that you'll be interacting with, and sort of how do you write and submit these batch jobs um, to run your workloads on an HPC system. Um, some of the prerequisites uh, for this talk, um, if you haven't um, sort of uh, uh, been with us from the start of the complex program this year. Um, I would say the the parallel computing concepts um, taught by Bob earlier this year, and the intermediate Linux and shell scripting. Uh, I think that Mary taught uh, are sort of the prerequisite knowledge that would be required for um, the material that I'll cover today. So this is the table of contents uh, for. Uh, I can't get this thing centered here. Uh, um, for today's talk. So I kind of want to review in general, you know, what is high performance computing, if you're not familiar, and sort of some of the um, concepts of the system architecture that you need to be aware of when you start thinking about how to talk to a, a job scheduler and, and what resources you need from it. Then we'll talk a bit about, um, you know, the 
general concepts of batch job scheduling and resource management in an HPC system, and then dive into uh, specifics about um, working with Slurm, which is one of these batch job schedulers you'll run into on an HPC system. Um, and the way that the, the talk is structured is to hopefully walk you through some of these um, you know, five commands that you see here, the command line uh, uh, commands that help you interact with Slurm and start running jobs on the system, getting information about the system that you need to sort of understand. These are sort of, I think, the five essential commands that you need to learn as you get started um, on a on the Slurm uh, managed system. And then I'll walk through some other exercises that, you know, point out maybe some best practices when you're structuring your job scripts and interacting with the scheduler. And then we'll end again, as uh, I think uh, Cindy mentioned, you know, the last half hour of the, the hour and a half sort of block that we put here is sort of open for answers, questions and answers um, that you might have after the, after the talk. And again, this is sort of all... Um, you know, new material that we're trying to pull together into this sort of complex format. And so if you have other questions and, and or suggestions on things that you we didn't cover in today's talk, that would also be you know super helpful to uh, get your opinion on. Okay. Uh, it's, it's not centered quite right. Okay. So uh, high performance computing. Um, what is it? So, right. So high performance computing is, you know, how is the use of supercomputers or computer clusters to solve advanced computational problems, right? And so hopefully it's it's pretty pretty basic, pretty straightforward. But you know, the, the key advantages um, for using HPC systems in your research are I think these three things, right? Is you can solve the speed, you can solve, you know, the problems that you might be working on on your laptop or desktop system. You know more quickly. Um, you know you can solve uh, at scale. You know so you have you have larger problems, more complex problems that you want to solve that are not capable of fitting within the compute resources you have access to on your laptop or desktop or even small um, campus cluster. You know these you know scaling to larger systems like we have at SDSC, such as Expanse. I'll talk about. Um, you know will help you. Um, you know, tackle those types of challenges essentially, right? And uh, another sort of key advantage is if you have many problems. So if you have sort of, sort of parameter sweep type problem where you need to run many versions of a simulation, say in a Monte Carlo simulation, you know, you would want to maybe run thousands or hundreds of thousands of the same type of job just in slightly different configurations, right? You, you know, that would take a lot of time on a, you know, your, you know, your lab desktop or your laptop at home, you know, an HPC system, you know, you can, you know, crank up the throughput of solving those, those problems more quickly. Right. And so this is, you know, these examples here that I show with the, the Hurricane Katrina, it's kind of a nice um, article that I think is linked to in here somewhere. Yeah. On the sides, uh, you know, this is sort of just a comparison of what they were capable of doing in terms of simulations for hurricanes back in 2005, when this hurricane hit, versus, you know, 10 years later, right? And so you can see by, with the, the increasing computing power and the sophistication of the models, you can get much more detail, solve, you know, the same problem, but in, in more high fidelity and, you know, hopefully more, you know, true in this case to the, the, the physics of the, the weather simulation. Um, but when you get started on HPC system, it can be a little bit intimidating, right? In the sense that there's a lot of, you know, different components that you might not be familiar with just, you know, working on your laptop or in a single desktop at home, right? There's uh, a whole distributed set of computing resources, storage services, different types of networks and it can be a little overwhelming if you know this is your first time getting an HPC system right so there's a lot of details and the different types of specialized hardware and and uh, compute resources that you have access to on a system like this on expanse um, and you can you know one of the the you know the tips for today is anytime you get on a new HPC system you should definitely visit the you know, the, the website and the user guide for the HPC resource. So in the case of Expanse, I put the link here. You can look at these details and try to start understanding what you have access to on an HPC resource. That's definitely, you know, the first place to start. 
Um, and just as an advertisement, right, uh, Expanse here at SDSC is um, under the NSF access program. So if you need to get access to an HPC resource like Expanse, um, you know, through the NSF funded resources, this access CI program, if you're not familiar with this, is how you apply for compute time on these systems. Now, uh, you know, this is sort of the... Uh, the the macro scale right of the the entire system but you know it, when you start talking about the resources you want to request on the the node level scale right you you also need to understand a, a little bit about you know what the hardware you have access to on that system is capable of and the different resources that you can request, right? Now, this is a little bit too detailed that you really need to know right now, but just as a example, this is one type of compute node we have on Expanse. So this is our GPU accelerated node from Dell. It has, you know, four different V100 GPUs in it. It has two Intel Xenon Gold uh, processors, you know, some amount of memory. I think it's about 300 and... 84 gigabytes per node on, on the GPU nodes. And, you know, so understanding a little bit about the hardware architectures that you'll see on HPC systems, this is sort of a, a very, um, you know, I would say a uh, you know, common type of configuration that you might see, right? But if you look into the details uh, even a bit further, I mean, even in this, this specific Dell node, you know, there's different um, topologies of how the hardware inside the nodes can be connected, right? And that can affect how you run uh, your workloads on these systems and how you make requests to um, the, the scheduler. Even. But, you know, this is a little bit too detailed for today's talk. And so the, but the mental model that I want you to have as we sort of walk through um, you know, the material today is, is, is this one, you know, so this is sort of the, the cartoon view of an HPC system that I like, like to use essentially, you know, there's a few different types of, uh, systems or, you know, subsystems that, you know, you need to sort of understand when you sort of first start out working on an HPC system. So there are, you know, you're working on your laptop at home or maybe desktop at your you know, lab at the office. Um, and you're going to connect to that HPC system over the public internet through you know, SSH uh, to, to log in usually. You know, there might be other um, options as well, but typically, you know, you start off logging in, you know, over you know, uh, SSH into the login nodes, right? These login nodes are sort of the front door to your HPC system. And this is where you interact with the HPC system. Usually it's just there for you to submit jobs, you know, transfer data maybe to the HPC system, edit some files and, and get your workloads running, right? This is kind of where you'll do your work, but not your computational work, right? All the computational work that you want to run should really run on the compute nodes on the system, right? And these are what's are managed by the scheduler, as we'll see today, right? Um, and just a few other parts, you know, that you'll you should get familiar with, right? The HPC system might have multiple types of networks that you um, uh, would interact with. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, some of the networks are used just for managing the nodes. Some are used for sort of high performance communication between nodes if you're running multi-node jobs. And then you also have things like um, shared uh, network file systems that you'll have access to, right? Where the storage is not necessarily always coupled to the specific node that you're on, right? This is um, very common on HPC systems and is very different than what you usually interact with on your laptop or your desktop at home, right? These file systems are mounted across the whole system and can be accessed from anywhere, right? And so these are a few of the different types of nodes that comprise a HPC system. And the, the one that you know we'll see today is the, the batch job scheduler that we'll talk about, such as Slurm, runs on sort of management nodes that, you know, the system administrators behind the scenes that keep these systems running. Um, you know, have their own nodes that run the services, such as the file systems and the scheduler and sort of monitoring software to keep the HPC system running. 
Okay, so that's kind of an overview there. And so on job scheduling and resource management. So we start talking about jobs and on an HPC system. There's really two classes of jobs that people think about, right? So there's sort of interactive computing and, and batch computing. So interactive computing is sort of what we're familiar with on our day-to-day -day use of computers, right? So you have applications that you are working with, where it could be word processors, in this case, some you know, presenting slides. And the, the applications that we're running accepts input from the users, us, as we execute those applications, right? You can run these types of workloads on HPC systems as well, right? And so some applications such as Maybe the, one of the most classical ones is sort of, you know, data visualization uh, applications. This is an example on the right-hand side of an application called Paraview, which is used for um, large-scale visualization of usually like simulations, uh, three-dimensional three, three, three sort of uh, physics simulations is, is, is what it's used for a lot. Um, and, and so, you know, this is an application that can run on an HPC system across many compute nodes and scale up to very large data set size. And it allows you to build this visualization pipeline to explore the data set that you might have coming out of your simulation or if, if, such as you know, the, the weather simulation that we saw in the, the, one of the first slides. You know, there's applications like this, uh, the ones, you know, common things that you might have is like uh, if you're uh, using MATLAB or uh, RStudio is very popular. You know, you have these GUI interfaces that you can use to, you know, develop your software, visualize your data. Um, but most of these applications can also run in batch mode, right? So you might design your workflow in the GUI, but you can also then run the application in a batch mode where once you design that workflow, you simply submit the instructions that created that workflow as you designed it to um, the batch job scheduler, right? And so this, the, a batch job is simply a set of instructions that run without user interaction, right? And so that's what most jobs on an HPC system are. So they run sort of a prescripted set of commands that are executed um, without your involvement, right? So you, the idea of a batch job is you write down all of the instructions that you want to run through the supercomputer. Um, you tell the supercomputer how many, what resources you need to run this job, um, you set up sort of the environment to uh, carry out the, that set of ta the, 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 that set of computational tasks, and you sort of provide that sort of manifest to what's known as the batch job scheduler to uh, to to run the job when ready. Right? So I don't let me see. All right, back, backing up here. Backing up here for a second. And so this is um, what we're gonna cover here for the second half of the talk is like, how do you um, um, get started with constructing these batch job scripts and submitting them to, in this case, a, a Slurm scheduler? So uh, let me see if I can, maybe I should just speed up. So if you're not familiar with the concept of scheduling, it's, I mean, it's, Pretty straightforward, obviously. It's, I mean, essentially, you have a set of tasks that you want to run. You know, in this case, this diagram on the left is showing sort of what happens when you instantiate a, you know, a, a, a program that you may have compiled right from from source code, right? So if you have some program that you've written, you know, that gets put into memory. When the program is, you know, run, these are abstracted out to processes and threads by the by the by the by the computer and there's a scheduler involved on every system that decides when those processes those tasks that you want to be performed run on your computing resources like your CPU 
right? And there's a whole sort of, in Linux, there's a whole sort of subsystem of different schedulers. There's IO schedulers, there's the process scheduler, there's, you know, if you have network traffic that needs to happen, you know, there's a network scheduler that, you know, all these things are happening sort of under, under the, under the hood, you know, behind the scenes for you. And so, um, but, you know, it is useful to um, understand sort of what's going on here uh, as you get started on um, HPC systems, because at the end of the day, this is, you know, this is all going on behind the scenes and can affect how your applications run on the system. And one of the useful tools, or if you're not familiar with, is TOP and HTOP are sort of interactive tools for interact, uh, inspecting sort of processes that are running on the system. We're not going to go into detail today about how to use them, but if you're not familiar with them, I put the links here to yeah, for you to um, check them out and uh, uh, read up on them. So, uh, as I've sort of already mentioned, uh, the batch jobs, so what is a batch job scheduler? A batch job scheduler is what controls and tracks where and when these prescripted set of commands that you want to run will get run on the HPC system and the compute resources it has, right? And so the way I like to analogize what is a batch job scheduler is, is it's really like your air traffic control, right? So you're the user over here. Your batch job script is kind of like your flight plan, right? You have a, a plan for what you want to do, where you want to go and what you want to get done. And you submit that job script to a queue, right? So there's always going to be a line of people who want to use the HPC system. And so your, you know, a batch job is intended to wait your turn essentially, right? And so uh, one thing, you know, as new users to an HPC system is, uh, you know, one of the most common questions we get is, why isn't my job running? It's like, well, you know, a lot of the time it's just kind of waiting there for your turn, right? And so if, um, you know, this is really a sort of, you know, submit the job to the scheduler and, and walk away and, you know, you're hopefully it'll all run correctly and your output will be available when the job ends. Right? Um, but so, yeah, so it's one thing to get used to when you're working on these systems and you're working with the batch job scheduler, right? You're not the only person who wants access to these resources. That's why we have the scheduler because it needs to determine who gets to run where and when and what resources they need, right? And so that's sort of the analogy that I guess I like to, to make here. And it's it's a complex problem that the scheduler is, is trying to solve, right? There's many competing interests for the different resources on any HPC system. And this is sort of, you know, if you want sort of a mathematical or sort of framework to think about it, I'm sort of a applied mathematician by training myself, you know, this is the, this is kind of the closest problem to what the scheduler is trying to solve. If you want to have sort of a mental model in, in thinking about what is the scheduler trying to do, right? So you have sort of a list of jobs, you know, of all of the users on the system that need to get done. Each one has different requirements of different resources and, you know, different processing times, but in every HPC system, there's a finite number of compute nodes, right? Machines that you can run on, right? And so what the scheduler is trying to do is trying to fit all of those jobs into, you know, a, a reasonable schedule that can get the jobs done within some set of constraints, right? And so every scheduler is configured in different ways of how to, um, you know, construct this schedule, right? There's different priorities, there's different queues you can get in and partitions as we'll see. And it's not an easy problem, right? The, the scheduler is trying to do its best to optimize a few things, right? It's trying to minimize, you know, sort of the time to completion of your jobs. It's trying to optimize the resource utilization of all of the compute resources on the system. And it's also trying to, you know, usually maximize the throughput of getting as many jobs through as possible, right? And so it's really trying to play this you know, as I think on the last slide, but this multi-dimensional sort of Tetris game, right? Where it's trying to fit as many jobs on all of the compute resources as possible, um, you know, but there's, you know, just practicalities of, there, there, I mean, there's, it's not an easy problem, right? And so if the scheduler 
uh, you know, schedulers fail <laughs> many times, you know, the, and there's, there's different quirks to different schedulers of, of how things can go wrong. And so if, you know, you think there's something wrong with the scheduler uh, you know, on an HPC system running, you know, feel free to email the, the team and say, hey, something seems off. Things can go off um, because these, these are complex pieces of software that can get into uh, unusual states. Right? Um, but uh, I think the last two things to think about here are the this this idea of fair share fair share scheduling that I've put here on the slide. Um, on, on most HPC systems, right, um, it's doing its best to optimize these these things above. But overall, most schedulers will run this sort of fair share scheduling type of algorithm as well, where it tries to also not only optimize uh, these these three points above, but it also try to fairly share all of the resources across all of the users as much as possible, right? So if you're a user who's been running, you know, for the last two days straight on a bunch of nodes, you actually will, the scheduler will dial back your priority in the queues, right? Um, to allow other people to use the resources that have been sort of occupied for the last couple of days. And so there's this complex sort of set of algorithms that are trying to sort of balance not only optimizing the, the use of the resources, but you know, also sort of the, the social uh, sharing of the resources across uh, 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 users as well. And although this talk is not about interactive jobs, uh, one thing that I think people sometimes forget is if you are interested in running interactive jobs with like GUI interfaces and things like that, right? Most schedulers will treat um, interactive jobs submitted to the scheduler just like any other batch job, right? And so if the batch system is very full and the resource utilization is very high, you know, if you want to, you know, run something interactively, you might have to wait just like a batch job would, right? So most systems are set up to treat them no different, right? I'll show you here, you know, you might have on some systems different partitions or queues that will be um, quicker than others. But in general, um, this is, uh, I think, one of the things that people who like to run interactive jobs sometimes forget. If, you're, if the system is very busy, you're gonna be waiting a while for that interactive session to start up. Okay. Okay, so we've been talking about sort of HPC systems and batch job scheduling more generally. So, but specifically for Slurm, um, we wanna get, get into some of the details here of how to get started if this is your first time working with Slurm. So uh, what is Slurm? So if you're not familiar with what Slurm is, so Slurm is, uh, free and open source distributed batch job scheduler for Unix like systems. Like most HPC systems run on uh, some form of Linux. And it's actually, I think the statistics is about 60% of all of the supercomputing computing clusters that you run into these days are probably running Slurm. And so this is, if you're working on an HPC system, you're probably using Slurm. Um, if not, I'd be interested to know what else you're, you're using. Um, but in general, most schedulers are very similar. There's peculiarities to, to each one. Um, a lot of the concepts we'll talk about in Slurm will apply to other uh, uh, batch job schedules you're, you'll encounter. Um, but the, you know, the, the key features of any batch job scheduler, including Slurm, um, are sort of listed here. You know, the, the scheduler is there to allocate the compute resources on the system for some period of time to your job, right? Um, it provides sort of a set of commands and a framework for interacting with the scheduler to start, stop, execute, monitor the progress of your jobs um, on these compute resources. And as I mentioned with this sort of fair share scheduling and things like that, it's, you know, there's a complex dance of tra it trying to figure out how to meet the demand for the resources as it manages this pending queue of jobs that's waiting to be run, right? Now there's 
tons of documentation uh, available. If you want to really dive into the Slurm documentation, I put the link here. Um, but I'm today I'm really just trying to give you the high level overview of like I think where you should start if you're getting started. So just coming back to this conceptual model, right? We sort of had these different types of nodes that make up the HPC system, right? So we have the login nodes, the management nodes, and the compute nodes. And I kind of just want to map to you sort of what Slurm looks like as it gets sort of mapped onto this type of conceptual model, right? And so this is, you know, from the Slurm quick start guide. And you'll see here, there's a different few different things that you need to know about Slurm, I would say, right? So starting in the, the upper right, or, well, I guess I, let me start with my bullet points, I guess. So there's sort of three main services that comprise the Slurm scheduler, right? So as I mentioned previously, it's a what we call a distributed batch job scheduler. And that's because there's different sets of processes that are sort of talking to each other to manage the whole system. And so the three ones that make up Slurm are this Slurm D, this Slurm CTLD, and this Slurm DBD, right? And so the Slurm D, this Slurm daemon, is a process that lives on the compute nodes, right? And so it manages everything that Slurm does on an individual compute node. So down here uh, in the, the yellow box, right? So the Slurm D, every compute node will have a Slurm D that talks to the Slurm CTLD, so the controller daemon, right? So the controller daemon is where all of the central management of the scheduler happens. This is where it's getting all the requests to, hey, here's my, you know, here's my job. Please put it in the queue, figure out where to run it. It's doing all this matchmaking, uh, these matchmaking processes of trying to figure out, okay, I have all these jobs. How do I optimize it and fit this into, um, you know, the schedule that's being developed constantly, right? And it's constantly evolving and assigning different jobs to different resources as they become available, right? So that's what's happening in the Slurm CTLD. And then of course, on every HPC system, if you haven't ran on one before, you know, all of the compute time and resource utilization is, is tracked, right? And so in sort of the, if you're familiar with the access program I mentioned earlier, right? You have compute credits and on every system, those credits are slightly different, but at the end of the day, it's, you know, tracking the, the computational compute, you know, the computational resources over time and how you spend them on your different research workloads, right? And so there's obviously an accounting system uh, involved there. And that's this Slurm DVD is sort of the daemon that, you know, interacts with any uh, sort of backend database that's doing that accounting. Okay. Keep track of time here. 20 minutes left. So also listed here in the, or shown here in the, um, you know, the quick start diagram is the the client commands. And so, you know, there's a few here that I haven't listed on the left, um, but these are the command, um, you, know, uh, pro, uh, you know, the sort of command line programs or just client commands that you will run typically on the login nodes to interact with Slurm as, it's, as, as you uh, do your work, right? And these ones on the left here, the, the five that I listed are the, the ones that I think are the most important for you, you to learn how to start using as you get started uh, with Slurm on an HPC system. So we'll walk through what these are. So the SQ command is what you use to query and view information about user jobs, right? And so in general, you really only care about, you know, either you should really only care about your user job. Um, but, you know, I think on most systems, well, I, I guess I don't know for sure, but I mean, so the SQ command will list information about the jobs that are in the queue essentially, right? So here I've taken a screenshot of uh, uh, running the SQ command on uh, expanse at SDSC uh the other day and you can see here every job has a few different pieces of information attached in this sort of default view you know every job that's submitted to the scheduler 
as a job ID. There's something called a partition, which I'll touch on here in a second. Um, you know, there's always, you can always name your jobs to sort of help label um, what uh, the different, you know, jobs you submit to the scheduler are. So you can keep, help keep track of it. And you know, there's always, you know, every job comes from a user. There's a state of the job, this PD, in Slurm stands for pending. So this, these, all these jobs that I'm showing here are, are pending, waiting in the queue. Um, obviously, the time would be the runtime of the job. You know how many compute nodes the jobs have requested, and then in the default view of Slurm, there's this uh, node list reason column as well. And this, what's being shown here, is reasons why these jobs are still pending. Right, and so there's a whole list of these called reason codes in Slurm that you'll see from time to time. In this case, at the top, this user is uh, requested too much memory, and so their jobs will never run. This max mem per limit, so there's different limits to the amount of memory you can request. This, these users have over requested, and so these jobs won't run. This resources reason code here. This is. Um, because there's not compute resources available, essentially. Um, the priority reason code is one you'll see commonly. It's basically, even if there were resources available, your priority in the queue is too low to run. So there's other people who have higher priority, essentially is what this means. Anyway, there's a whole set of uh, uh, different views and formats. You can pull out different information about the jobs in the queue. Um, but in general, you're going to be using it just to check the status of your jobs. Like, is your job running? Has it started? Is it still in the queue? If it's not in the queue, it won't show up here, you know. Um, but one of the recommendations I have is, you know, if you, you know, I mean, you should really only query about your own job. And so there's, if you're not familiar with uh, command aliases, one thing you can do is, you know, set up an alias for the SQ command to only check your jobs using the general uh, environment variable, uh, the user for, for your username. So this basically just means running the SQ command, checking only for this username, which is going to be your username when you're running on the login node. Right? And so this will help minimize sort of the queries against the scheduler, right? So remember, this is a distributed system with many users who are also running SQ. Uh, you don't really need to know other people's information. And so, you know, this will help minimize the, the, the taxing the scheduler with, with lots of queries. And, and don't run, as I put here, don't run SQ incessantly or like, you know, accidentally in like a, a loop or something like that, um, this can cause problems for the scheduler, right? So you wanna be you know, um, conscientious when you're using these commands to interact with the scheduler and, and not overtax it. Um, similarly, but on the other side uh, of the, the scheduler, you have the sinfo command. So the sinfo command is used to query information about the compute nodes and the slurm partitions. So I haven't described exactly what Slurm partitions are, but essentially uh, one of the ways Slurm is different from, well, I guess not every scheduler has partitions, but every everyone usually has a, a an idea of a queue. But in, in Slurm, a partition is kind of like a subset, is usually a subset of compute resources in the system that you submit your job to. So it's almost like its own queue, right? So for example, on Expanse, we have, you know, compute resources that only have CPUs and we have compute resources that have CPUs and GPUs. And these are segmented into different partitions, right? We have a compute partition with CPU only nodes and we have a GPU partition with GPU accelerated compute nodes, right? And so these partitions, in these cases are not overlapping because if you want to request a GPU accelerated resource, you do that specifically to one of those partitions. And 
you know, if you don't need a GPU, you don't submit your job to that partition, those, those, those GPU partitions. And so it's just a way to logically organize um, sort of the, the different, you know, lines you get in for resources, essentially, uh, on an HPC system. And so you, the, the key thing is you just always want to make sure that you select the most appropriate um, partition for your job, right? And every, you know, the, the SINFO command, I would say it's not as, you, you know, you're not going to be using as much as um, the, the SQ command when you get started. Uh, um, the, the information that you usually need from the SINFO command uh, about the different partitions and the node types and things like that are usually in your um, HPC systems user guide. So I put the link here to the Expanse user guide. Um, and it, it, it gives sort of a high level overview of what the different limits and job types are that can go into the different partitions. Um, and, and you'll find that pretty much in every, I mean, you should be able to find that in every user guide that you um, uh, come across. Uh, um, but, you know, sometimes the user guides are out of date. And so the, the, the real time information though is where you would find it is through SINFO. Um, and the different types of formatting, you know, reformatting the output and things like that. If you really want to dig into the information about the nodes and the partitions, the SNFO commands, which to use. Okay. We're running a little long, so I'll try to pick this. I think we'll, so I think we'll probably get through um, the first batch job uh, section here uh, pretty easily. Um, I might have to sort of push off the best practices part. Um, you know, we only have about less than 15 minutes left. Um, but I'll, I'll do my best here. And we'll, you know, if you can stick around for the question and answers, um, we can talk a little bit about those in more detail then. Okay. So the idea for the these complex talks is eventually we're, we're trying to also have sort of self-contained tutorials. So I've called... Um, these uh, uh, exercises, and I've put the material for these examples or exercises um, in our complex uh, batch computing uh, repository. Let me just see if I can pull that up real quick. Uh, so all of the um, scripts and code that you need to sort of replicate some of these examples that I'll try to run now um, are, are available here. And they're only designed right now, obviously, to run on uh, the systems we have at SCC, in particular Expanse. So if you're an Expanse user, these should work out of the box for you, um, other than maybe changing your account information. Um, but the, this material is available here. Um, we don't have quite the uh, um, self-contained tutorial yet to walk through this later, but that's sort of the plan on the, the roadmap. So check back here uh, if, if you're interested in that. Um, OK. So uh, job script. So this is if this is what I'm calling you know, your first batch job script. And so there's a few key components to any batch job script. Um, in, in this case, this is obviously a slurm batch job script. So a batch job script is simply a shell script usually, right? And so the a shell script, if you're not familiar with writing shell scripts, usually starts with a uh, what's called the, the shebang sequence, I guess is what it's called. Uh, I don't know the why it's called that, but that's the, the name. Um, and what this first line in any shell script is used for is really telling the operating system how the script should be interpreted, right? And so, you know, when you're doing scripting, usually it's some sort of interpreted language. And in this case, it's just a bash script. And so this is sort of the default uh, way to write uh, a uh, start your, your bash script. In theory, it could be a Python script as well, or probably some other languages, but that's kind of the two that I use. And so that's just kind of the, the default line that you put there to um, tell what interpreter is going to be used to interpret the script. Now, if you're familiar with shell scripting, which is kind of a prerequisite for this one, um, you'll notice the next section is uh, a bunch of more comments, but these are special comments. These are 
what we call um, in you know working with Slurm, these are the S batch directives. So these are Slurm directives that specify to the scheduler um, the information it needs to know about your job, right? And so every batch job script you write in Slurm, you know, is going to include these S batch directives, right? So these are the most common uh, components that I think are sort of the minimum set that you, you'll you have in any job script, probably almost on any system that you uh, interact with, right? So you probably want to have a uh, label your job with a name, right? So this is just naming it after the name of the exercise. Uh, there's, again, accounting that's going to be happening on these systems. So you have usually an account number that you need to assign to how, you know, what account do you charge this job to when you submit it to the scheduler? That uh, You have to choose a partition. So you have to choose uh, some set of nodes, types of nodes that you want to run on. In this case, we have some what are called debug nodes on Expanse that, you know, uh, are used for a sort of quicker turnaround, a little bit more interactive um, uh, work uh, when you need something quickly. You'll request some number of nodes, you know, when you're first getting started out, if you're not familiar with sort of multi-node jobs and things like that, you'll request, you know, definitely start with a single node. Uh, there's an end task, uh, an end task per node um, directive, which essentially is usually used to control how many copies of the program or commands that you want to run. So if you are familiar with MPI and things like that, that's usually the number of MPI processes you want to start. Here, there's the CPUs per task. So how many compute cores on a node do you want to use? Um, today's HPC systems, right? The, the number of cores on any system is becoming quite large, right? On Expanse, the our CPU only nodes have 128 uh, CPU cores per node. And so if you can't use all 128 cores on a node by yourself for whatever application you're running, right? You can adjust, at least on Expanse, we allow these sort of uh, what we call more shared node jobs where there'll be multiple users running jobs on the same compute node because not all users need all 128 cores per node on our system. And so you'll you know dial in the number of cores you need, how much memory you need. Of course, one of the most important constraints also is how much time the job requires, right? Uh, on most HPC systems, the maximum time is usually about 48 hours. Uh, one of the tips uh, that you'll see later on the slides that I'm definitely uh, not quite gonna get all the way through is um, you know when you first start out running jobs on systems, you might not know you, you know you're if you're working on a new HPC system or you're using a new piece of software on a system that you're somewhat familiar with, right? One of the problems users have a lot is how, how do I know how long to set you know how, how do I how, there, well there's two problems how many how many compute resources do I need how much memory how many CPUs and how much time do I need? And it's really hard to really know that outside of the, out, out of the box if you're like using a new piece of software, you really need to experiment a bit. And, but then dial that in as you get more familiar with how the types of workloads that you're running, uh, the resource requirement, what the resource requirements are and how long they take. The, the more accurate you can be in your resource request, the more efficient the scheduler will be for you. Right. So if you always request 48 hours, even though, for example, this job will take, you know, less than 30 seconds, uh, right, the scheduler will try to fill your request. Right. If I put 48 hours here in the time slot, it will really try to find me a block of 48 hours on a single compute node with uh, one CPU and one gig of RAM. Right. And that's not, you know, that's sort of a, you know, that's going to cause your job to wait. That's going to cause the job to wait much longer to find a slot in the schedule that the scheduler has for all the jobs, right? So the more accurate you can be in your resource request, the better. Okay, so 
five minutes. Okay, let's see. <laughs> what do I want to get to here? Okay, so um, okay, so we've talked about the the resource request and the S batch directives, and the the last uh, key part of any job script is the set of commands you want to run, right? So we've set up essentially, you know, the type of script it is, the we've requested the resources that are required to run the job. And then what is the job itself that we want to run? In this case, it's a very simple, we're just running the host name command and sleep, the sleep command, which was basically just means the job will sit there for 30 seconds and do nothing else. Um, yeah, so let me see, let me do just a quick demo of how you can use some of these, uh, use some of these uh, uh, example scripts and exercises that I've put into the slides. So uh, here we're going to just run this first exercise. And where is it? So here is the the script on GitHub. I'm just going to download that to my account on Expanse here. So you can, you know, try to run this on any HPC system you have. If you have access to Expanse, this is, you know, uh, it'll definitely run here. You can see here that I have the script that I've shown you in the slides. No changes, I guess, except for maybe this is two minutes in the slides. And the most important command that we need to get to before to run out of time here is the s batch command, which is on the next slide. This is what you this is the command you use to then submit your job script to the scheduler, right? And so all it is is you run s batch and the name of the scripts, and this is what happens. So the scheduler responds and says, "Okay, I've assigned this job ID to you," and now employing the use of the SQ command, we see that the job is now in the queue waiting to run on the debug partition. Here's my name of the job. Here's my username, job is pending. And it says the resources are not available, right? And so this is uh, one thing about running live demos on a production system without a reservation. We can see here, now I'm using the sinfo command that I mentioned earlier. I'm checking the node information about the debug partition is what this command is showing. And it's saying that the node state is allocated. So someone else is currently running on these debug nodes that I was hoping would be available to run um, the, the demo here. So we'll let that sit there uh, for a second because we only have a minute or two left before people might be dropping off if they're getting off at the top of the hour. Um, but I, I've tried to capture uh, these exercises, uh, screenshots of the exercise and the commands that are being run. Um, yeah, the most important one <laughs> today was definitely getting to the S-Batch command, like how do you submit your job script here? Um, let's see, what else did I say? Uh, yeah, so one of the things that, one of the tips maybe when you're writing your job script that you, that I don't see people using a lot of um, is uh, these sort of sigils that are allowed uh, when formatting sort of uh, um, different parts of uh, S-Batch directives. And in particular, the, the one that's most important usually I, I would say is this, this output S-Batch directive. So this output, S batch directive um, provides uh, a way to, uh, I mean, essentially the, the output is the name of the file that the standard output from your job goes to, right? And in this case, I'm using these special symbols here. This percent %x assigns the job name that you put to into your script to the name of the output file. I put a little O here to indicate output file also label that output file with the job ID. And the percent %n here actually labels it with the node that it ran on. So you can kind of see this happening in this screenshot here that once I submit that job script, 
it runs through the scheduler you can see that it was running on these nodes and the you know if you look at the output here i have the job name i have the output with the job id and the the node name and and one of the you know best practices when you're when you're getting started here is to try to keep yourself organized right if you have a static say output uh file name uh you know if you run multiple versions of that job and sort of not in different directories and things like that, you can easily overwrite uh, your output, right? And this is gets problematic if you're trying to debug a problem and, you know, the job failed, but then you reran the job script without having a separate output to see what changed between uh, uh, jobs that you ran. Uh, this is, you know, one way to keep yourself a, a bit more organized is to use some of these special symbols and, and characters when you're designing your, your job scripts. Okay, and now I'm over time, uh, but we have 30 minutes to keep talking for those who are interested in sticking around. And we'll try to dial this in next time a little bit uh, better, but um, I'll stop here and see if there are questions in the chat that have come up. I don't know if Bob and Cindy are here. Um, and we can talk about these other exercises that are in the, um, in, in the slides, but uh, let me just go ahead and stop here.